Good morning, church. I say this, uh, I think, almost every week, but Jesus is alive, amen? amen. That's good news. If, if, if you've never been to church before or gathered with the church or been with us here, this is why we're so hopeful. <laughs> this is why we're singing. This is why we're confident. This is why we're filled with joy and expectation because Jesus is alive. And because of that, we, uh, we give our life to him. We want to worship him. And we want to immerse ourselves in his living word. Amen. And that's what we're going to do. So uh, before I get going, my name is uh, Mr. Shafto or Pastor Nick. Uh, I get to teach high school Bible for the school. And then I also get to uh, uh, teach uh, with the church as well too. So it's, it's a joy and it's an honor. Uh, but this morning I am, I am eager to just uh, dive right in. And so we have started a series last week. On John 15 and the first nine verses of John 15. So what I want to do this morning, instead of we usually stand for the reading of God's word, I feel compelled this morning to just read it over you. I love doing things differently, switching things up, but it's also, I think, a beautiful thing for God's word also to be read over you. And so I want to take a moment and read God's word over you. Is that okay? Good. This is John 15, verses 1 all the way through 9. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. This is the word of God for the people of God. All glory be to God and God's people said, amen. 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 Let's pray. Jesus, we long, we long for you. Just as we sing and say, we want more of you. That's all we want. In a world that wants many things, in my fleeing heart at times, Lord, I want many things. But in this moment, I, we declare, not just me, but as a body, that we want you and nothing else. And so we know that you are here, that you are working. And so I pray that by the power of your spirit, would you open our eyes and open our hearts, and I pray that we would never be the same. We love you, and everybody said, amen. amen. All right, if you weren't here for week one, I'm going to give you a super quick recap. Are you ready? <laughs> so John 15, 1 through 9 takes place uh, right after some of the upper room discourse, okay? And there's a lot of things in the upper room that we could talk about and things happen, uh, but ultimately, Jesus is saying, I'm going to go, and where I'm going, you can't come with me. And everything begins to get flipped upside down, and the disciples love Jesus, but are also confused and slightly scared. And then Jesus says, arise, come with me. And they leave, and Jesus walks them all the way in the middle of the night to a vineyard. And these two things... Last week, we were only really able to cover one verse. <laughs> but it was that rich, 
and had that much depth. And what did Jesus say in that first verse? Because these two things he says, we have to hold on tightly as we go through the rest of these verses to actually understand the beauty and the depth and the good news that it has to offer. And these are the two things that were said. I am the true vine. Jesus right away in a vineyard says, I am the true vine. What does that mean? I am the source of life. Nothing else is. Right? As we sing, all we need is you, Jesus. All we need is you, Jesus. You are the source of life. And then what's the second thing we talked about last week? My father is the vine dresser. Vine dresser, you could say the gardener or the owner of the vineyard. And why is that good news? Well, if he owns the vineyard, he is the most committed and passionate to getting his branches to do what? Bear fruits. Praise the Lord. And so if God is the source of all life and he is committed to my life bearing fruit, where else would I want to go? Where else would I want to go? And so there's your little recap. We continue on. We pick up in verse 2. And let me reread it for you. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why? That it may bear more fruit. Okay, right away, when, when you're reading the Bible, and I said this last week, when there is repetition or words that keep popping up, even in one verse, pay attention. Pay attention. In verse 2 alone, ready? Fruit, fruit, fruit. Three times. Fruit, fruit, fruit. Well, we should probably define what fruit is before we move forward. So let's do that. Let's define fruit. What is the fruit? I'll give you kind of a more like structured definition, and then I'll give you some scripture, and hopefully it helps both people understand the answer to this question. Okay, fruit is this. It's the accumulation of of our character, okay, our conduct, our attitudes, and our actions. Guys, character matters. Character matters. Conduct matters. Attitude matters. Actions matter. Are we following along, church? It's true for all of us. These things deeply matter. Let's look at Galatians 5, a more simplified version. But the fruit of the Spirit is this, ready? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's Galatians 5. That is life in the kingdom of God. Does that not sound like a life that all humans, religious or non-religious, desire to have? I want a life full of love in my innermost being. I want a life full of joy and peace and goodness and kindness and gentleness and self-control deep within my innermost being. That is what humanity desires, and it's because we are all made in the image of God. But like I talked about last week, how does that begin to show up? That is the life abiding in King Jesus. That is what Jesus has for you today. That is how rich his nutrients are. He, you will walk in with the mess, Right? I don't remember who said this, but it's, it's beautiful. You'll walk in a mess, and you'll walk out with the message of his goodness. That's what he does. You lay things at his feet, and he makes beauty from ashes. He brings order to chaos. He causes things to flourish. This is the life the world wants. Go to Barnes & Noble. Go to any bookstore. Go straight to the self-help section. It's big. It is. 
Why? Because people want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And you'll get a book that says 10 steps to be the most joyful person of your life. And in our flesh, we're like, I'm buying it. <laughs> I want it, right? I want, I want joy. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. I want joy. And we take these 10 steps. What's the, what's, what's, what's the matter with that? Well, let's dig into the rest of what Jesus has to say. He has something better. So I want to go under this, uh, this title called Fake Fruit. Okay? The enemy and our flesh do a wonderful job of taking a good thing and twisting it. So we read the thing like the fruit of the Spirit. It's a good thing. And in my flesh, in my wayward heart, in the temptation of the evil one, I just take a good thing and just go, and twist it. All the time. Well, how do we do, how do, we do that? How do we distort it? How do we lose sight of the actual gospel? Well, the first thing we do is we exchange the truth for a lie and we settle for fake fruit. Okay, how? Let me show you. Let me read verse 2 again. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. We gulp, right? What? What? And then all of a sudden, terror reigns in our innermost being. I have to have fruit. I have to figure this out. I have to muster it up. I have to do something. So if that Barnes and Noble 10 steps to joy is half off, I'm in. <laughs> Buy me it. Is that what Jesus is saying? So we muster up the strength on our own and we, we try to be loving and we try to be joyful. We try to be peaceful. We try to have self-control. And then we are exhausted, right? Any parents in the room? It's, it feels like an everyday thing for me. I'm, I'm going to try to have peace out of my own strength today. <laughs> like 10 minutes. It's like gone, gone, gone. And my heart is revealed, okay? And I'm like, yeah, I need a savior desperately. I cannot do this, okay? So we're exhausted after trying, and then even worse, what happens? All of a sudden, even in, an even more exhausting thing creeps in. Guilt and shame takes up residence in us. Because we can't do it. And now we believe. We believe that God is just like mildly disgusted with us. And because of that, we distance ourselves from him. Feeling like we are not enough, and then all of a sudden, this Christian activity becomes really hollow. This terrifies us even more, and we begin to do what? We distance ourselves from Christian community because we are scared that if someone really sees us for who we really are, they would go, I knew it. I knew it. You're just a branch that's going to burn. It's like, wow, wow, wow. Have a good day. So we muster up fake fruit and burn ourselves out. And sometimes we applaud each other while, did, while we do it. <laughs> great job. <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> You're doing great. I don't know if that's like an abundant life. I don't know if Jesus lived, died, and resurrected so that we could be full of shame and guilt and live a life of performance and feeling hollow and saying, am I good? Am I entertaining? Am I doing it? Jesus has so much more for you. Jesus has more for you. That is not life in the kingdom of God. We have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Remember, I told you how to hold on tightly to these two things. You are not the vine. Remember, you are not the vine. We need new eyes to see this text. And I pray that as we continue to read this morning, there is an exhale. 
like a supernatural exhale deep in your soul that gives you confidence that Jesus loves you and is for you and is doing a mighty work in you through his power. Exhale. Jesus is the vine and his father owns the vineyard. Take a breath. Is that not good news to a fast-paced, identity-earning Western culture? Whew. That's the exact opposite of what of us, many, many of us are what are, we're running in. Let's keep going. I want to speak a better word to you. Because there has to be better news than just trying harder. Amen. So here's the good news of Jesus to you. And let, let him say it. Ready? Verse 3. Ready? Already you are clean. Thank you, Jesus. Don't miss that part. Already you are clean. Why? Because of the word that I have spoken to you. Already you are clean. This is your new identity in Christ. This is why the gospel is really good news. And it sets apart itself from every other religion or every other gospel the world tries to throw at you. The gospel is about receiving an identity, not earning one. Okay. The gospel is about receiving an identity, not earning one. Every other area of life, go to it. You have to work to earn your identity. In Christianity, we work joyfully from the identity we were freely given. You are already clean. This word clean is forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. A big theological term, justification. And you're like, what does that mean? Ready? Just as if it had never happened. Justification. That's how you are seen, clean, forgiven, fully justified by grace through faith in Jesus. Anyone thankful for the gospel this morning? Yes, yes. If you are sitting here believing you are a dusty, dirty, I don't know, useless branch. No, no. If you are in Christ, you are already clean because of the work of Jesus. His perfect life that you couldn't live, he lived on your behalf. His death on the cross, bearing the weight of your sin, and his resurrection from the grave. Defeating what? The power of sin and death over your life. We are saved by grace. So in Christ, we have to look at verse 3. You are already clean. Psalm 51. Wash me whiter than snow, Lord. You have been washed by the blood of Jesus. But then if you're anything like me, you rejoice in that. And as you're learning the text, the next thing you go is, praise God, but what about the fruit? What about the works? Jesus said, every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Let me help you understand something about the gospel. You are not saved by works. Okay? You are not saved by works. But you are saved to works. Hear me clearly. You are not saved by works. But we are saved to good works in Christ Jesus. This, when we understand that full gospel, there's a hunger for holiness. An obedience that's not rooted in, let me earn my identity. No, it's walking out the identity my father has proclaimed over me. Do you see the difference? That's the good news of Jesus. We are not saved by works. You are washed clean. By the blood of Jesus. By grace through faith in him. But we are saved to good works. There is goodness that Jesus wants to work in us and through us. The same spirit that saved you is the same spirit that transforms you. 
If we are saved by grace and now the spirit dwells in us, that spirit doesn't just stop working. The spirit doesn't take residence up in your innermost being, dwells in you, and then sits down, kicks its feet up, and twiddle, twiddle its thumb. Know what it does? It begins to resurrect you from the inside out, giving you new desires. I want to be like Jesus. I want to speak like Jesus. I want to do like Jesus. I want to live for his glory. Does it happen instantly? No. But day by day, little by little, growth. Just little by little. I tell my students all the time, I'm like, is this growth? They're like, yeah, it's growth. I'm like, is this growth? And they're like, barely. But I'm like, it's growth. It's growth. Right? If you look at a, if you look at a chart, like, right, you have seasons of, and then down, and then down, and then up. But then when you move back, And watch what God is doing. What has he been doing? Growing you. Growing you. Making you more like Jesus day by day. That's the power of the spirit. The spirit that saved us. The grace that saved us is the grace that transforms us. He's not done with you. He has has so much more for us. But who's producing it? Who's producing this? So my next point. And it's off of verse 4. Ready? Abide in me. Abide in me. It didn't say, here's your 10 steps to be a good Christian. God, doesn't, God does not rescue people to make bad people good. He brings dead people to life. And sometimes I think we settle from just bad, he's maybe bad to good. I'm like, no, he's going to bring you to life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, flourishing in all things, little by little, day by day. Because he is the vine, and his father is the vineyard, and he is so committed to you bearing fruit. You're not the vine. You don't own the vineyard. But Jesus says, abide in me. Why? Well, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it what? abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you do what? Abide in me. We will not bear fruit if we do not abide in Jesus. Here's what abiding means in a a simple way. Next week we're going to really go into that word and break it down. But here's what abiding in Jesus means just quickly. Okay, it's a decision, and we must choose it. Ready? Jesus, I am not leaving you. I'm staying right here. I'm not going to any other vineyard. I'm not going to any other vine. I am going to stay right near you because you are the source of life. Where else would I want to go, Jesus? Jesus. You are all I need, and you have all I need just in your presence. Where would I go other than you? You are my rock. You are my satisfaction. You are my fortress. Where would I go other than your presence? I'm yours. Less of me, more of you. Prune me. Shape me. I want to be more like you, Jesus. I think of when Jacob wrestles with God. Say, I'm not letting go of you. I'm not letting go of you. I can just picture this is what abiding in the vineyard is. Jesus, I, I, I'm not letting go until you bless me, Lord. I know, the, I know the goodness you have for my life, and it's only going to come from you. And so I'm choosing to stay near you, right at your hip. Where else would I go? You are the vine. You are the vine. If I remove myself from the vine, just like if you're talking about an actual vine, what happens to the branch if it removes itself from the root? From the vine, what happens? 
It can do nothing. It can do nothing. It just withers. And I think some of us have bought into a lie, including myself in seasons of life, that we can remove ourselves from the true vine and attach ourselves to a false vine and bear like tiny fruit. It's like, it's, they're raspberries. They're just a little moldy. But they've still got taste. They're great. They're expensive, so eat them. Okay? <laughs> Sorry, that's from parenting. <clears throat> Jesus has more. <sighs> Jesus has more. More. We want to abide in him. Right? Choosing to stay close. Do not settle for being around Jesus when you can live life in him. If you've been in church for a long time, this is a real temptation. Guys, think of what just happened in the upper room with Judas. How much was Judas around Jesus? A lot. He heard sermons, saw miracles, walked with Jesus, asked questions. Do not settle for being around Jesus. Live life in him. Live life in him. And you will bear what? Fruit. Fruit. Why? Because he's the vine and his father is the vineyard. He's going to do the pruning. He's providing the nutrients. He alone is the source. Just posture yourself and say, Jesus, all I want is you. You are my greatest treasure. Shape me. Use me. All I want is you. So the only thing we can do as a branch is receive nutrients. And you cannot receive nutrients from afar. The branch is not in charge of the fruit. The vine is. There's a lot of repetition in this passage. Because in our flesh, we forget. And if we're honest, I want to be the vine. I do. I want to be the vine. You see that? I produce that. <laughs> right? You see this vineyard? I own it. I'm too lazy to prune it and stuff like that, but I own, the, I own the vineyard. What? That's my pride. That's our pride moving in. It's good to be near God, yes? It's good to be near God. All right, move on. Real fruit. Real fruit, okay? I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart, me, apart from me, you can do nothing. Ready? I have some great encouraging words for you today. Are you ready? If you came for encouragement, ready? Here we go. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. I'm out. <laughs> Man. If you are someone who deals with pride like I do, that verse, apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah, Jesus, but I worked hard. Cool. Produced no fruit. Because you didn't, you, didn't you didn't remain in me. You settled to be around me, and honestly, I was not your greatest treasure. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I, I, I believe this verse is, is hopeful and haunting all, <laughs> all at the same time. It's only bad news, it's only bad news if he is demanding you to be the vine, but he's not. So it's good news. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The works that we do outside of the Holy Spirit will be burned up. Wow. Wow. Apart from you, Jesus, I can do nothing. So how can I get real fruit? Well, on your own, guess what? You can't. You cannot. And I, I really believe, I, I asked one of my, my senior class, okay, high school. I said, do you believe that people can change? Do you believe that people can change? Do you believe that angry people can now be loving people? And people with addictions can now have self-control? Do you believe people can change? The entire class said no. 
People are always, but hold on. And you know what, I, I looked at them, right? And I said, I agree. I said, if apart from the Holy Spirit, no one can. Our world has given up on changing the inside. You want to know why? Because they can't. So we settle for changing the outside. There you go. We settle. So we try to start changing us. We try to change ourselves from the outside in. When the Holy Spirit is the only one who can change you from the inside. Oh. Go for that. Go for that. So I look at them and say, I agree. And they look at me they're like, oh. Right. No way, Mr. Shafto. But then I looked at him and said, yeah, apart from the Holy Spirit, no. The Holy Spirit is our helper. Our helper who is present and transforms us day by day, little by little, more into the likeness of Jesus. And we get to experience that fruit. That's good news, yes? That's good news. I love what Shane Pruitt says. He's a, he's a young preacher, uh, and he's preaching to so, so many millennials and Gen Z, and I believe God is working powerfully through him. But he, he says this, ready? He says, when the gospel changes who you are, it will also begin to change what you do. I'll say that again. When the gospel changes who you are, it will also begin to change what you do. All of our actions flow from our heart. If you want to change your actions, change your beliefs. Because all of our actions flow from our heart. And only the Holy Spirit can change our heart. From the inside out. So come to Jesus. He will save and transform your life. Or another way I'll say it, abide in the vine. And you will bear much fruit. In his presence, love overcomes fear. Some of you, that's your testimony. For others, it's this, ready? Joy has overcome a life of boredom. Or a life of apathy. For others... Peace overcomes anxiety in the presence of Jesus. Patience overcomes anger. Kindness overcomes self-pity. Faithfulness overcomes faithlessness. And self-control overcomes addiction. All in the presence of Jesus. As we just posture ourselves like a branch and say, Jesus, you alone are the source of life. I will not leave your side. Shape me. Prune me. You are what my heart desires. I love you, Jesus. And all of a sudden, the branch begins to bear Because we are abiding in Jesus. Psalm 1611. You reveal the path of life to me. Oh, that's what Jesus is doing in the vineyard. He's re revealing the path of life in him to his disciples. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. Last thing. Who's the fruit for? It brings glory to the Father. But in my seasons of going after fake fruit, when, when I start seeing like those moldy raspberries that I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, check those out. Stand in front of the mirror and I'm like, I am fruitful. Look at me. Look at my moldy raspberry and my half-peeled orange. The fruit is not mainly for you. The house we lived in before this, uh, our neighbor, kind, kind man, and he had a huge orange tree, huge orange tree, and actually... A, not totally, but went into our backyard a little bit, and it would, it would drop oranges. And he told everyone 
in that neighborhood, on that street, he said, this orange tree, and this orange tree had a lot of oranges. He's not a believer. Or he is a believer. He is a believer. But I was having a conversation with someone who's not a believer. It was the three of us, okay. And he said, this tree and this fruit in my backyard is not for me. It's for my neighbors to come and pick and eat. And I went back into our house and I was like, Ugh. anyone have like the Holy Spirit just speak through people? As Jesus bears fruit in our life, when we posture ourselves in a community, in a workplace, in a school for people who are starving for good food, starving to experience love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness. And when you walk around, and as Jesus is bearing fruit in your life, you know what they do? They grab that fruit, and they eat it. And you know what happens? They taste and see that the Lord is good. And teachers lead young ones to Jesus. And nurses lead patients to Jesus. And politicians lead people to Jesus. And small businesses lead people to Jesus because they are bearing fruit and saying the fruit is not for me to stare at myself and look glorious. It's to bring glory to God as a starving community. And I put myself right in the middle of it and say, eat the fruits of my father. Eat. And then a city begins to be flipped upside down. Church, do we desire this? Do we desire this? I want to be a church that bears fruit. I also want to be a church that a community flocks to to pick from it. And we freely eat, eat for the glory of God. And it's from Jesus alone. So how do we, how do we respond today? I close it up with, uh, with two things. Obviously, if the Spirit is compelling you to respond in a specific way, listen to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but take a moment. Take a moment to look at your life. Look at what your life is producing right now. That can be daunting sometimes. But as you do that, I need you to remember the gospel we just went through. That Jesus just preached through. If you are in Christ, you are already what? Clean. And the Spirit is in you. And as you abide in the vine, the Spirit will stir us up to have a pure and holy desire for good works. Not to earn an identity, but because we have received the identity and we just want to walk it out by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is your life producing right now? Can we identify fruit? Next one is, and the band can come up or or Nehemiah or or whomever. But allow God to have access to you. God always has access to you, okay? Even when I'm like stiff arming God. God's not like, oh, he's this an amazing stiff arm. (laughs) I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to my son or my daughter. He's too powerful. No, okay. I understand that. So when I say this, it kind of sounds funny, okay? But there's a posture of the branch. In the vineyard that says, God, you have access to my innermost being. I'm yours. Speak to me. Reveal false vines in my life. Show me where where I have settled for fake fruit. I know you have more for me. I want you. I know I'm not the vine. I know I'm not the vine dresser. But I am the branch. And all I can do is receive you. So Lord... You have 
access to me. Speak to me. Speak to me. Fill me up. Touch my heart. I want to overflow. That secret place, right? Our innermost being. And at times that means we got to get quiet. Quiet. We got to get quiet. And that's what we have an opportunity to do as we gather with God's people. That's what we have an opportunity to do tonight. Yes, it's a, it's a worship night, but it's, it's posturing. It's being a branch. <laughs> it's posturing yourself to receive the presence of Jesus. Because you know, I will have no fruit. I'll never experience the depths of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, all those things. Apart from you, I can do nothing. I will not leave your side. I will not leave your side. Take some time to ask God to shine areas on your heart that need to be cut back. Maybe be pruned. Maybe God is very clearly calling some of you today to walk away from very specific things. Very clearly. And you can know it right now. God's saying, walk away. Walk away. Walk away. Be willing to give him access to those withering areas in your life. Jesus is the true vine. And he is the vineyard. Where else would you want to go? He is committed to you. He is, he is the, the nutrients that will produce the fruit in you. He's the one who will harvest the fruit. He's the one who will prune and all those things. Where else would we go? Let's pray, church. Jesus, I, I, see, I see hunger, Jesus. That's what we want to be. Lord, I don't want to fill myself with the junk food of the world and the false vines. Then all of a sudden, I'm not hungry anymore. I just feel sick. I don't want it. I want you. I don't want a cool life or a wealthy life or even at times a perfectly healthy life. Lord, I want to bear fruit. And so Jesus is super scary to say, do with me as you will. I trust you. I trust you. You're going to produce fruit. Help me trust you. Help us trust you. We want to be a fruit-bearing church. Lord, in a world that is hurting, in a world that is broken, in a world that is starving. May we be salt and light. May many come to see your fruit and take of it and taste and see that you are good. Lord, we love you. We trust you. And all God's people shout, amen.